tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Walter Ladwig. I'm a senior lecturer in international relations here in the Department of War Studies, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce David Loin. Uh, David Loin is a senior visiting research fellow here. Come on in, come on in. Uh, in, uh, in the Department of War Studies. He is, of course, uh, much better known for what he did in, uh, we might say, his previous life, where for nearly four decades he was an award-winning uh, foreign correspondent. David has covered conflict and development issues uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, and of course in South Asia, and he is most closely associated with the country of Afghanistan, where he was Am I correct in thinking you were the only Western correspondent who was embedded with the Taliban when they took Kabul the first time in the 1990s? He subsequently visited Afghanistan um, every year since then, has written several books on the subject, um, and I think really admirably, uh, particularly from a, a scholarly standpoint, didn't just observe and write about the country, but has at times uh, rolled up his sleeves and, and actually gotten involved. So spent uh, more than a year as a strategic communications advisor to the uh, president of Afghanistan. And today he's going to talk to, to us about his uh, latest book, which is The Long War, American Afghanistan Since 9-11, which the San Francisco Book Review has called a powerful work of history that will engender high regard in the years to come. So okay. David's going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have ample opportunity for Q&A and discussion. Great. David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate, as Walter says, on, on, this, on this wet night. Um, I want to go right back to the beginning of the war and look at right at the end of the war because, I mean, we can all agree um, the beginning and the end were really bad. The end was certainly very bad, the way that uh, the international community just scuttled and, and abandoned Afghanistan last summer. So um, just to go back, right back to the very beginning of uh, the Afghan war in, in 2001, um, what America came in with was the plan that they would only have a light footprint of forces. They wouldn't put in large, heavy forces into Afghanistan. And I think that, in my view, was you know, one of the war's very first mistakes from the American military point of view. The only American boots on the ground were groups like this, Special Forces Detachment, who were alongside President Karzai, you can see there, wrapped in a blanket, um, or later became President Karzai. And Hamid Karzai, quite bravely, he'd been um, a Pashtun, uh, uh, he, he, the Taliban at one point asked him to be an ambassador for them, but he, he never really worked alongside them. He was always really opposed to the Taliban, but he was seen as very much a, a, a uniting figure. And he quite bravely came into the south of Afghanistan while the Taliban was still there, initially just on a motorbike. Um, there's a wonderful book by Better Dan, a Dutch journalist called Two Men on a Motorbike, which uh, tells the story of Hamid Karzai's first arrival and how he came in. Um, the Taliban found out where he was, um, things became very hot for him, he had a sat phone that the Americans had given him, and uh, they came in and got him out before the Taliban got to him. And he, then he went back in with this, uh, this detachment, commanded by uh, Jason Amory, the guy in the, the, uh, the light beanie hat there, um, and uh, um, this is the, the only photograph that uh, existed of them, because um, a couple of days after this picture was taken, on the 5th of December, and I think you can actually chart many of the problems that happened over the 20 years in Afghanistan to what happened on one day in December, back in, uh, December, uh, back in uh, 2001, on the 5th of December. The first thing that happened was a misdirected American bomb hit the position where the sol two of the soldiers in that picture were killed, one other soldier who's not in that picture also killed, American soldiers. Uh, more than 20 of Hamid Karzai's soldiers killed, he was slightly injured. And um, so from the very beginning, he knew that smart bombs didn't necessarily always go where they were supposed to. He had a, a real lesson in you know, how um, the, you know, the, the precision warfare is not really quite precision warfare um, in terms of uh, at least smart bombs. And, and, and uh, come in, come in. <coughs> um, the second thing that happened that morning, very soon after the bomb, in fact, was he gets a phone call from the hastily convened Bonn conference um, and is, uh, is named as the interim leader of Afghanistan. Remember, the whole country has not yet fallen to the Taliban. Um, Kabul has already fallen, the north has already fallen, with major 
um, aerial bombardment, but very few American troops on the ground. So it was, a, it was all a, an air war. The Taliban were bombed out by airplane air power. And um, Karzai was then named interim leader of the country by this uh, conference in Bonn. The third thing that happened uh, that morning was a group of Taliban came, deputed by Mullah Omar, their leader, to offer surrender terms to Karzai. And uh, they wanted to negotiate um, a very, in fact, you know, the, their terms were very, were very light. They didn't necessarily demand very much. Um, they wanted to be able to return to their farms. They, of course, they didn't want to face any trials. Um, they wanted some impunity for, for their commanders. Um, and there was talk of handing over all of, all of their weapons caches. Um, and of course, they would sever their links with, uh, with Al Qaeda. Um, and it was the following day that um, Donald Rumsfeld at the Pentagon press conference made it very clear that there was going to be no surrender. So from the very beginning, the Americans wanted a military defeat of the Taliban. Um, and anyone who spends five minutes studying insurgency, um, Walter's written a book about it, um, will know that you know, on the whole, insurgencies are not defeated by, uh, you know, by major powers. You, 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 you don't win in an insurgency, nobody actually wins. They're, they're conflicts that tend, uh, tend, to, t tend to finish in, in different ways. And, but from the very beginning, the Americans were not wanting to negotiate with the Taliban. In fact, it took more than a decade before they changed that policy, um, which I think was, was, a, was a fundamental mistake. So you saw three things right at the beginning of the war. Um, bombs that don't go where they're supposed to, causing Afghan grievance. Um, the, the, the imposition of America deciding who the leader of the country was going to be, very much a sense of, of this being you know, an American dominated project, um, rather than allowing Afghanistan to decide for itself. Um, and thirdly, um, that, uh, that the Taliban offer of surrender was, there was going to be no talks with the Taliban. The Taliban were going to be uh, defeated on the battlefield. The race to Kandahar ended up, in fact, with two American units almost fighting each other because there was, as well as Hamid Karzai, um, there was this guy, Gul Aga Shurzai, um, and as the CIA station chief in Islamabad said, make damn sure he's wearing a turban when he introduced him to an American general before he went in. The, the, the American sense was that these were the people who were going to uh, pacify the Afghan countryside. They put back into power people like Shurzai, um, you know, with again with an American detachment with him in order to give him support. And if you were in the south of Afghanistan and the name of Gulag Shurzai um, came to you in the, in the, in the mid 1990s, he was one of the um, most corrupt warlords um, in the south of the country, a bandit chief um, whose excesses as the governor of Kandahar in 1994 were the reason the Taliban emerged in the first place. Um, so by putting Gulag Shirzai back into power in Kabul, it looked to the Afghans as if America was taking a side in their civil war. Um, and so rather than you know, coming in, understanding the context, realizing who these people were, who the good guys were, and who the bad guys were, um, the old warlords were, were put back into power. Many of these people expected to face trial. Um, instead, millions of dollars were shoveled into their pockets. And you could get money as an Afghan uh, warlord very easily in those days by saying, um, that guy, that, the, the mayor of that village, he's, um, he's Al-Qaeda. And uh, the, the, the Americans would drop a bomb on his head and give you the money. And that was so they, they, we, were, we were taking sides in small local conflicts all the way along, right from the very uh, beginning of the Afghan war. And the place where we saw this most, you know, egregiously, really, uh, the, the, we saw what had, what had happened um, in terms of policy was such a mistake, was the Battle of Tora Bora um, in uh, October, just a, um, um, a couple of months, uh, in fact, before the December, uh, no, it's just after, sorry, it's just after the, um, the December the 5th event, when Osama bin Laden, um, was found to be holed up in the Tora Bora cave complex that he built in the 1980s um, during the war against the Russians. And of course, this was finding Osama bin Laden was the reason for the war. There were 3,500 US Marines available. 
um, to, uh, to, 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 to conduct this operation. They are helicopters, warm, um, warm, you know, winter kit. They were G'd up because of 9-11. And their commander, um, Jim Mattis, later, of course, the US Defense Secretary, later a general in the US Defense Secretary, was screaming at CENTCOM to send in my boys. And they weren't sent in because of the demand to have a light footprint. And I put that photograph in of um, foreign journalists because there were other end, <laughs> other end. There they are. Come here. I put that photo in because there were more foreign journalists at the Battle of Tora Bora than there were foreign soldiers. Um, and in fact, the guy on the left there, um, uh, Peter Juvenal, um, has, 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 was then a, a photographer, a very good friend of mine. Um, has, uh, in fact, went back after August last year. He's just he's in a uh, Taliban jail. He was jailed 12 weeks ago. He's been there for 12 weeks, and he was trying to do business in the new Afghanistan. So you can see how difficult Afghanistan is to is to work in um, under the under the Taliban now. So there was a sense from the very beginning of not putting troops in, of um, a real obsession with um, the way General Tommy Franks put it. Um, that's about really about the Russian war, a real obsession with how Russia had been defeated in Afghanistan. America didn't want to repeat what had happened um, in the Russian war, um, running around, losing lots of soldiers. Um, we're in and out of there in a hurry. Um, but at the same time, there was this contradictory sense in the Bush White House that America was the exceptional country that wouldn't just leave Afghanistan um, stranded, that would actually make, leave this a different kind of country. And although <clears throat> there was this strong sense in American foreign policy of not doing nation building, and particularly among Republicans um, who'd seen Clinton in the 1990s um, doing a, a variety of diff small different wars right across the world, um, which they didn't, about every two years during the Clinton years, during the eight years of Clinton, there was an intervention somewhere in the world and they didn't want to be involved in that. Um, but at the same time, there was this sense from, from George W. Bush that they wanted to leave Afghanistan a better place. And to the surprise of officials on the ground who'd heard that there was going to be you know, no, no real aid for Afghanistan and certainly no, no military support, in the spring of 2002, he went to Virginia Tech, which was the university that George Marshall had taught at, and made this speech um, appealing for a Marshall Plan for, um, for Afghanistan. And the Marshall Plan, you all know, was the plan that rebuilt Germany and some other European countries after World War II, a huge American intervention in, in post-war Europe. So there was a, a real sense of this contradiction in plans. So without troops on the ground, standing up warlords, but at the same time, um, uh, funding, beginning to fund, but not funding with any sort of sense of, of a, a really functioning policy. And there was no pause at the time for discussion of goals, timelines, strategies, no single decision that led to the long war. But instead there, was, there were a series of small changes in policy during 2001 and 2002 that led to incremental increases in troop numbers, um, and although the light footprint was designed to satisfy the tax-paying public who had limited appetite for um, wars, certainly long-term foreign military engagements, it failed to stabilize the country. And it set the very conditions, in my view, that made lo that long-term engagement inevitable um, because of the, there weren't enough troops um, right at the beginning. Uh, so what you had with these, what, this is Marshal Fahim, who was the uh, had been the commander of the Northern Alliance forces, the Jamiat forces, after Ahmed Shah Massoud had been killed uh, by the Taliban a month before. And um, he was uh, really keen on his militias. He was made the defense minister of the new government, immediately broke every uh, deal that he'd made with uh, international forces by bringing his troops into Kabul. Um, within a year, there was almost a standoff between American troops, international troops, and Fahim's troops, um, who, because he had his, he still had his tanks and he still had all of his heavy armor, um, very close to Kabul, and <clears throat> so so you have this contradiction that the the army was under a, a defense minister who had no appetite to stand, to build a standing army 
in the new country because he wanted really to, to continue to build up his militia. So he was standing in the way of, of what the international community were trying to do um, right from the beginning. Um, in the lawyer Jirga in 2002, the first meeting of Afghanistan, you know, since the civil war, since the Taliban had emerged, um, the Taliban were not there and should have been, in my view. They should have been, had some representation of Taliban figures, but the country wasn't ready for that. But it was the first opportunity for the old communists from the 1980s, the jihadis from the 1990s, and diaspora figures, people who came back from abroad, people like Ashraf Ghani, later became president, were very prominent in the lawyer Jirga. But the people who were most prominent were the old warlords, who, who when it was set up, swept in and took the seats at the front and were most prominent in, in what happened in that, uh, in that lawyer, lawyer Jirga. So, and at the same time as this quite significant um, uh, 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 security mistake was made in terms of handing the country over effectively to old warlords, a huge amount of money began to pour into Afghanistan because of the George Bush's Marshall Plan ambition, a billion dollars in the first year that you know, went up to several many billions um, in the years to come. The, the World Bank was started talking about an aid juggernaut that had descended on, on Afghanistan and of course all it did was to fuel corruption. That by the way is 19 million dollars. Um, that photograph happens to be um, um, <coughs> uh, just one, one sort of tranche of, of money coming into, uh, coming into Afghanistan. And the sense of corruption beginning to take root but, and the money going into the hands of the warlords, you know, unaccountable funding um, coming into the country um, began very early on. And there was a sense in which, from the beginning, um, rather than building an Afghan state, too much of that money was going outside the state. Very large donors, particularly the United States and Japan, um, put their money into parallel systems rather than putting it through um, state systems. And I write about this quite a lot in, in, this, in this book, the, the, the problems of corruption that began right at the beginning of Afghanistan because of um, this parallel economy that was built. And in, uh, you know, t after 2014, when we started taking the scaffolding away that was, was supposed to be building, uh, holding this thing up, it was as if there was no building left behind. Um, you know, all, all that had been done was to build this sort of infrastructure um, of, uh, of scaffolding because so much of the money went into the hands of uh, security contractors, foreign contractors, you know, effectively went back overseas again, um, <coughs> rather than actually, you know, coming into um, the country. <laughs> and, of course, um, 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 as, page there, as um, uh, the corruption began to emerge in the, in the country, it became easier for the Taliban to regroup. 2001, 2003, it was quite difficult for the Taliban to recruit. They were, people were tired of them, there was a new opportunity, there was a new government, people were talking about democracy, whatever that was, people didn't really, really understand then what it meant. Um, but uh, by 2005, 6, um, I mean, I remember going into rural villages and it became much more easy for the Taliban to uh, recruit people. Um, because of this, um, uh, because of this corruption, and uh, because of the way that the, the government was seen as, as predatory rather than supportive of the people, but because the police were seen as predatory, um, and because the government was seen as, as, as predatory um, rather than rather than supportive. So, in the rural villages where the Taliban um, controlled security, where the Taliban controlled governance, um, they were able to operate a very different kind of system. And people would talk about the Karzai government as this sort of alien, corrupt force, um, whereas the Taliban were seen as their protectors. And that was the language that they, they, they were using. And the way <clears throat> this was put to me by one American analyst, and I really like this phrase, in any society, <clears throat> you have about 4% um, uh, thugs and about 1% of warlords. And the foreigners didn't understand this, so they gave money to the thugs. So the inevitable reaction of the 95%, everybody else, was to ally with the extremists um, against the thugs, um, because they were the people who were the problem. And so there was a sense in which there was a rational, rural, you know, support for the Taliban, 
um, because of the people that we had, we had re re-enfranchised back in Afghanistan. And at just the same time that um, uh, this sort of, this very sense of a small light footprint, a money going wrong, um, <clears throat> by 2004-05, there'd been an agreement in NATO um, that the country was now a country that NATO would stabilize. This was called the International Security Assistance Force. We, was, we weren't fighting a war. We were supporting um, Afghan forces who were fighting their own war. And, the, German, and the, the, the really significant powers that came in, Germany to the north, Italy to the west, um, America in the east, you know, those were the big powers who remained in Afghanistan until last summer. They were the most significant troop contributory na nations. Alongside the UK, of course, um, actually, and the Canadians in Kandahar, but the UK who, uh, who took Helmand province most uh, controversially. They wanted to go to Canada, but there was an argument over who, would, who was going to go to the south. The Canadians had some investment in Kandahar. So uh, Tony Blair had agreed as Prime Minister that what, he wanted, that what Britain was going to do in terms of uh, priorities in Afghanistan was counter narcotics, was going to end uh, the uh, uh, poppy growing. And of course, because most poppies were grown in Helmand, um, uh, it, it was rational for, for UK forces to go to Helmand. And from the very beginning, um, this was seen as a, a policing operation to, to support aid. And I remember Henry Worsley, who was the, who was the, uh, the, the SAS officer who, um, on the ground right at the beginning in 2006, who handed over to the conventional forces, um, very quietly saying in the street to me, um, they, um, um, we've come to police aid, but there's no aid to police. Um, and the, the politicians who sent the soldiers in, and I think this uh, is actually the most stupid uh, uh, phrase uh, by any politician in the 20 years of the Afghan war, um, will be happy to leave in three years and without firing a shot. As John Reid, who was the, US, uh, the UK Defence Secretary, who sent in British troops in 2006. This, he, he really liked this phrase. He came out with it a couple of times at a press conference. Um, and this sort of sense of policing a not, not really um, being engaged in a shooting war, which of course uh, the United Kingdom forces were very significantly uh, from the very beginning. Um, more, uh, more sanguine uh, uh, military analysis came from Brigadier Andrew, uh, um, Andrew Mackay, who was one of the best British officers who went in there. Um, we went to Helmand with our eyes closed and our fingers crossed. And there was a sense of, you know, that the policy was not connected. Again, I write quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of detail in, in my book of the disconnect in policy in 2006 between Whitehall, Brussels, uh, the soldiers who were training to go in. And if you read Patrick Bishop's book, Three Para, um, Three Para was the, the unit that, that went on the ground right in the, in the first place. Um, he has a lot, of, a lot more detail on that. A couple of years later, there was a reset. There were four US presidents altogether engaged in the, in the Afghan war. And in 2009, uh, President Obama came in, um, very much wanting to change policy. His, his, his ambition was to end the war. His ambition was to pull out all American troops, um, to leave the country, um, as he did in Iraq. And he spent the whole of 2009, his first year in, in, in office, um, engaged in a whole series of, of decisions on, on, the, on the Afghan war. More thinking went into Afghanistan than any other foreign policy um, objective in the Obama White House during that time period. Um, senior officials that I talked to for the book said more senior executive time, i.e. President Obama's time, was spent on the Afghan uh, file than on, than on any other file. Um, <clears throat> quite quickly in the spring, he fired the uh, commander on the ground, General Dave McKinnon, who was a really decent, uh, really decent man who was actually doing counterinsurgency, but he wasn't charismatic enough, I think, for some of the people in Washington. He wasn't watching his back. Um, and in fact, you know, this was quite a big deal. Um, McKinnon was the first US expeditionary field commander to be fired uh, since General MacArthur in Korea in 1951. Um, so uh, this was, you know, in terms of, of, um, of political uh, act activism, political decision making in a war, but this very, very much made it Obama's war. Uh, McKeon had been a 
uh, a really successful tank commander. He commanded the move across the desert in 2003 into Baghdad, which had been the longest and fastest uh, armored assault in military history, um, and highly successful in, 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 in those terms. But he was, he was yesterday's man by uh, 2009. Counterinsurgency was the new thing. Um, COIN, as it became called, under General Stan the Crystal, who replaced uh, McKinnon in the field. And McKinnon was, you know, was, was the heavy army. His, his uh, skills were not regarded by this, the new light army, the new, um, you know, this sort of very much this sort of intellectual um, thinking your way through everything. Um, Stan the Crystal loved whiteboards. And, he, and if you can see any of the, the used to talk about insurgent math, um, and he'd go around Afghanistan into into um, into forward operating bases with a whiteboard, and he would he would work it out. So there's Afghanistan there, and you can see the Venn diagram. The insurgents are on the side. The irreconcilables are in the top of it. So you know, some some of the insurgents were irreconcilable, and there's respect and honour as two words. The things that's what the soldiers were supposed to be doing with the Afghan population. And insurgent math was. Um, if you take, you can see 20 insurgents at the top, which is the final result. If you take 10 insurgents and you shoot two of them, how many are you left with? And of course, you know, everybody says eight. And he says, no, you're left with 28, because um, the two insurgents have, <coughs> have you know, nine cousins between them. And so you know, it's, it's, it's a multiplier for the number of people you kill. So you've got to be really careful of not killing people. And that was all of this, all of this counterinsurgency thinking in order to try to connect the population to the government, separate the population from the insurgents, classic inser um, counterinsurgency theory, um, going back to David Kalula and, and um, Chairman Mao, in fact, that was the key sort of learning of counterinsurgency, of draining the, uh, the water out of the pond um, so that the fish, um, you know, the fish would drown, and the fish, of course, being the insurgents, and the water being the, being the people, being, being people who would then be on the side of the, of the government. Um, McChrystal only lasted a year, and I think it's one of the counterfactuals of what-ifs of the Afghan war. If the ash cloud hadn't happened, do you remember the ash cloud in 2010, which, which came and suddenly stopped all global flights for about a week? Um, and McChrystal at the time was on a, a tour of Europe, um, going from country to country you know, quite quickly in his little executive jet with his team in order to G up the Allies um, and make sure that there was this alliance. Because by then there were 150,000 troops in Afghanistan, 50,000 of them from, mostly from NATO countries, and he needed to keep them on side. He was in Paris, it was his wedding anniversary, um, his wife was there, he went out to dinner with the boys, um, you know, some, some uh, drink was drunk, um, and there was a, um, a Rolling Stone correspondent who was a teetotal, dried out drunk, who, who um, was sitting quietly on the side, who'd been given very open access to McChrystal and his team, and he wrote up all of the stuff about the kinds of nicknames that this, this uh, um, that Team America, as, they, as their opponents called them, McChrystal's very tightly knit group of officers who uh, worked with him very tightly, and of course it all appeared in Rolling Stone, and he was, he was out, of, out of office. And I just wonder if the ash cloud hadn't happened, he was committed to staying in Afghanistan for as long as it took, three, four years if necessary. And he had this will to really change the, uh, change the nature of the war, whether it would have been different. He was replaced by General David Petraeus, <coughs> um, bottom of the picture there on the left, um, on the right, by the way, that's Nick Carter, who was um, who commanded in the south of Afghanistan, a British officer, later became chief of defence staff here, the head of the of the armed forces in the United Kingdom, and at the time, as a two-star major general, was commanding more American troops than any other British uh, officer since the Second World War. So, you know, there was there was quite a lot of, of quite big military activity going on for these large armies, these very large forces that were in. Um, in Afghanistan, and there was a peak of um, 150,000 troops, as I, as, I, as I said, and some of, some of that development spending began to stick to the sides and began to be effective. And by 2011-12, you were actually beginning to see you know, some effect of, of what had happened um, in Afghanistan, but it was still a really, really tough slog. 
And Marja, for example, which was a big campaign in 2009-10 uh, to take a huge area of the poppy fields in Western Helmand, um, became bogged. It was supposed to be quite quick, and it became bogged down in uh, what uh, McChrystal called the bleeding ulcer. Um, Nick Carter was the, the general who was commanding that. I think it was a really tough, a really tough battle. And despite what they were doing in terms of, of improving development and in terms of taking more ground and pacifying more ground, they were still unable to control corruption. And that remained a significant challenge um, for Afghanistan. And in, in, um, in 2011, there was a report in the Nation uh, magazine uh, in the United States, 2009 rather, which sounded the alarm about how serious things had become on corruption. This is an huge convoy of, of trucks bringing in um, goods to uh, this huge force. The ground forces were, ground uh, convoys were going in from Pakistan for food and, and uh, uh, um, fuel and ammunition and all of the things that uh, the American army at war needed, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and all the rest of it. Um, and around 70% of what was brought in came across, um, came from overland and was very vulnerable, inevitably, to, to attack in these big exposed uh, convoys that weren't, weren't very heavily armoured. And in order to uh, get those convoys going, protection money was paid all the way along uh, to people who, in the end, at the end of the day, turned out to be the Taliban. And this report in The Nation uh, worked out that around 10% of the two billion uh, dollars a year that was uh, going to fund this uh, supply convoys. So the United States was literally funding the enemy, um, and uh, uh, um, it's, as Congress, the Congress report that looked into this found there was a reliance on warlords for supply chain security, which has the effect of dramatically undermining the objective of bolstering the Afghan government, which is what the war was about. So you have you have this. Corruption was literally um, uh, eating into the very logic of, uh, of, of, uh, of counterinsurgency. And trucking contracts were only a small part of military spending. By these years, the American military was spending more on aid in Afghanistan than USAID. And huge amounts of money, most US uh, reconstruction money, went through the army, not through um, uh, the State Department. The peak year was 19 billion in 2012, which was just a billion dollars less than Afghan GDP. So you had an aid budget um, uh, being spent by military officers who weren't experts in um, places to put aid, and with very little coordination between the military and civilian sides of government. General John Allen, who was there in 2012, told me that if there was a joint civil military development plan, he wasn't told about it. There was a you know, strong sense on, on uh, both sides that this wasn't, uh, wasn't coordinated. And at the same time, you had surge troops leaving on timetable. There was a timetable for pulling troops out of the country. And you had um, a, a civilian surge that was uh, the biggest failed part of President Obama's plan, as well as putting in all these soldiers. He wanted, he, he wanted to try and recruit um, agricultural experts, teachers, etc., to go into the Afghan countryside. Uh, both in terms of quality and quantity, um, that failed uh, really uh, dismally in terms of the kind of people that came in and the failures of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the recruitment campaign in the first place. Even paying them, American departments, the Department of, of Agriculture, didn't have a program uh, to be able to pay people to work abroad in the way that they wanted to work abroad. So the, the, systems, <coughs> the systems didn't operate for the, the uh, presidential desire to do things. And at the same time, there were still civilian casualties in very big numbers. Um, and <coughs> civilian casualties mostly caused by special forces um, uh, rather than the conventional forces. And what you saw was, I mean, this quote from... Uh, Doug Luke, who was, who, who was running the war in the White House. Um, uh, the sun would come up and there'd be a burning compound. A conventional infantry unit would have to go and figure what happened, just make amends with the locals, and it just went on and on. And that sense of 
civilian casualties, which again corroded the capacity of the international community to build the kinds of links with local people that they were trying to build. By now, President Karzai, every time there was a, any kind of a civilian attack, um, would would go immediately onto television and weep and and uh, you know and demand apologies from the Americans. And because of social media, because of Facebook, people were hearing about these much more quickly than they had before. The flash to bang time, um, as they like to say, in terms of um, information was much quicker than it had been before. So it was very difficult for the United States um, and the international troops to sort of control the narrative, even if they even if they managed to with this with the number of civilian casualty incidents that were happening, quite big incidents. 80 people you know, killed in a wedding party, 100 people killed by a bomb um, who were civilians. I mean, some appalling attacks, one after another, during 2009, 10, 11, when there, these, uh, when there were all these troops on the ground, which caused um, very significant, uh, again, erosion of the relationship between the, uh, the state and, and the people. 2016, 2017, the third American president comes in, um, it's exactly the same as, as 2009. America, a president comes in wanting to close down the war, not his war, um, didn't see it as uh, being a very uh, good war to be in. But a year later, the generals who he'd appointed, uh, including Mattis, and most significantly Mattis, as his um, uh, defense secretary, persuaded him to change policy. Um, and uh, um, for the first time, there was no conditions put on withdrawal of international troops. Until then, there was, there was very, they, were, they were on a timetable. Up to 2014, the surge troops were pulled out, some of them remained. There was the end of combat operations for NATO in 2014, but after 2014, American troops could still carry out offensive actions against the Taliban and other insurgents, in, but only in very limited circumstances mostly in self-defense. So you saw significant reduction in American firepower, 2014, 15, 16. And in 2017, Trump took, took the gloves off, said to General Nick Nicholson, who was then uh, commanding in Afghanistan, you can, you can drop what you want, as, you know, as much as you want on whoever you want. And in fact, Nicholson then uh, took that uh, literally and dropped the Moab, the, uh, the, the largest bomb that America has in its military arsenal. Um, on a huge cave complex of Islamic State um, in the spring of 2017. And um, I saw the effect of that because I was working, when I was working in the presidential palace, and a group of elders, I mean, it was effective, it delivered you know, liberty to one valley. A group of elders came to the presidential palace with a white horse, which they presented to the Afghan president as a great war leader. It was a slightly bizarre event. Um, so, there was a strong sense that um, also at the same time in this policy in 2017 that they were going to move towards um, uh, negotiations. So um, people who talk about uh, negotiations, the, the, the mantra about negotiations is to have a mutually hurting stalemate. And until 2017 there wasn't a mutually hurting stalemate because the Taliban weren't losing. But all of this uh, offensive capability, 2017, 2018, led to a peace deal. And by 2020, you had, and it was a really bad peace deal, so you had this really good policy in 2017, pushing the Taliban to the negotiating table, but then you had uh, Zalmay Khalzad, who was appointed as the, uh, as the American negotiator, who negotiated the deal, who was told effectively just to pull out. Trump wanted the troops out before the election um, in 2020, ideally. And uh, there was this very strong demand on, uh, on, on Zalma Khalistan. And it was, a, it was a really, so this is where the beginnings of the end of the war, and why the, the end of the war was such a, a, mis a mistake and such a scuffle, really, in that we, we, we fled from Afghanistan rather than leaving in, in any kind of um, uh, good style. But in uh, um, 2020, there was finally this, this peace deal signed. And all that it did, all that it demanded of the Taliban was that they would sever their links with Al-Qaeda. In return, America had a, a very strict timetable withdrawal. And there were two other parts to the peace deal. There was a ceasefire and 
uh, a demand that uh, the Taliban would talk to the Afghan government. Um, but neither of those were conditions based, neither of those had any kind of international um, apparatus to control them. So there was, there was not really any seriousness about the other parts of the policy. There were some desultory talks that went on in Doha between the Afghan government and the Taliban um, in the autumn of 2020 and into 2021. But they, they were never serious and there was never a ceasefire and there was no, there was no apparatus to, uh, to manage the talks and they, they really limped into the ground after the presidential election uh, when Trump was defeated in, at, the end of, uh, at the end of 2020. So, fourth American president comes in um, last year, um, President Biden, and um, he really wanted to close the war down even more than the other two who'd, who'd come before him. And in the uh, Obama White House, when he was the vice president, he was the strongest voice in the room, always, for, um, uh, for no uh, uh, more troops in Afghanistan. He'd have pulled down to 1,000 troops back in 2009, rather than uh, having the surge. And if you look at the body language of these two men, um, this, is, this picture's taken um, when uh, Vi then Vice President Biden went to Afghanistan soon after the election, between the election and the inauguration. Um, and uh, he's not, you can see it, he's not having any of it. As Prince Karzai tries again um, with one more American, you know, tries to sort of, tries to say, look, you know, um, just give us a few dollars more. Um, and, uh, there was what was described by a, a senator who was at this dinner as a dinner to remember um, when Biden starts, uh, after this meeting in the private office, starts shouting at, uh, at President Karzai. And in, and in the end, he, he stalked out of the room and just said that he wasn't here he, because he wasn't getting the guarantees he wanted in terms of, uh, in terms of cutting corruption and uh, ending corruption for the Afghan government. So in 2021, when he... Uh, he extended the Trump deadline for only a few months. He pulled the troops out, and this is, this is the day he made the announcement. He walked to Section 60 of Arlington Cemetery, um, which is where the graves of those dead in Afghanistan and Iraq are buried. And um, he said to the cameras, uh, just after, after he was walking across, he said, from the very beginning, I never thought we could un unify Afghanistan. He didn't even see it as a united country. It had no sense of... Afghanistan as being a, um, a, a function place at all. Um, so we left, uh, that's uh, August 2021. Uh, Major General Chris Donoghue, um, an echo of the famous picture in, in February 1989 of General Gromov crossing the Friendship Bridge into Uzbekistan, the last two general officers in the last two wars. 10 years in the Russian war, 20 years um, in the American war. Their government lasted three years. Uh, the American back government lasted three hours after, uh, after the last helicopter left the, uh, left the American embassy and then there was that terrible fortnight when they were uh, trying to get as many people out as they could. And, you know, um, we lost the war and we lost in the most significant uh, sense that the reason why the war had happened was to end terrorism from Afghanistan. This is the first United Nations sanctions report, six months after uh, the fall of Kabul, um, looking at um, the Taliban and its links with uh, Al-Qaeda, which they promised to sever in the, in the 2020 peace deal, you'll remember. <clears throat> the UN Sanctions Committee found that the Taliban had had a tactical alliance with Islamic State in the months before the fall of Kabul in August. Osama bin Laden's son had visited Kabul um, quite openly. Um, Al-Qaeda have only maintained strategic silence so as not to compromise Taliban efforts to gain international legitimacy. And the sense of uh, the Taliban wanting to gain international recognition is, is very, very strong. Um, but terrorist groups enjoy greater freedom than at any time in recent history in Afghanistan. So it was a defeat really on um, epic, um, epic proportions in Afghanistan. And I just wanted to, because uh, oh, we're running a bit short of time, my lessons, if you like, of the Afghan intervention, um, which are understand context, don't go in and uh, give money to warlords. Um, we're too obsessed with an exit strategy. People are always talking about exit strategies in these insurgency campaigns. Um, what's needed instead, in, in my view, is an intervention strategy 
We need an intervention doctrine. We need forces configured um, to go into these kinds of countries because you know, if countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, countries that see um, expeditionary capability as being something our militaries do, um, and having a responsibility to protect of uh, people in countries abroad, um, then we need to have forces configured to do the task, and we need to train those forces in order to do the task, and we need to have much better coordination um, with um, the civilian side, with defense, diplomacy, and um, development so that the three Ds, so-called, have much more understanding. Because in, in Afghanistan, counterinsurgency was made up on, on the hop. It was made up all the way along between the State Department but, um, and, but, um, with, um, um, and with, with the Pentagon in the United States. And I just want to close, oh, just that's um, a, um, a view, of, again, of Armandola's desk, by the way, uh, which is a bit of a shock to me when I saw that photograph, having sat in that chair on the right in the meetings that I had with the President, um, which I, I put in. Um, we can talk perhaps about options for the future in, in questions as to what we, um, what we might do, what the international, the international community might do in Afghanistan because they're quite tough. But I just wanted to close um, with a few pictures which I'll rattle through quite quickly, which are before and after pictures because although it was an epic defeat um, in Afghanistan, um, the international community, the West, didn't lose the people. And more than half of Afghan citizens were born since 9-11. It's a remarkably young population. And the Taliban are finding it an alien society. It's much more difficult for them coming in to Kabul and to the cities of Afghanistan now than when they came in in 1996. And they're not doing the same things that they, that they did. I was actually on the phone just in, in the taxi coming here tonight um, to a friend of mine in Kabul who said, because um, it, we're just coming up to Nowruz, uh, New Year, which is a, in, um, in the Persian world, in, um, in the Islamic world, is seen as a great moment of uh, celebration, but not traditionally in the Pashtu world. Um, but she said, no, in, in Herat and in some, you know, some of those cities, there's more sense of Nowruz this year. So there's a sense in which you know, the Taliban are allowing you know, some differences to, to come. And that's because although, you know, a lot of the aid was misspent and a lot of, um, you know, what happened went, uh, went clearly wrong and the war, was, the war was lost, you know, we spent the Marshall Plan and we didn't get Germany out of it, um, uh, which the Marshall Plan had, had delivered in, in uh, 1945. These are before and after pictures of, uh, of Kabul. That's the main street below the Balahissa in the north of the city. Um, that's it today. So that's the... Sorry, what, what year are these? That, those are 2001. So that's what the Taliban left us in 2001. They've been in power for five years. And that, 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 that was what, that's what Kabul looked like after the Taliban had been in power. That's what, they, that's what Kabul looks, looks like now after what's, uh, what's happened. So it's down right in the center of town, the, the Two Swords Mosque, so-called now as a teeming bazaar in the, in the middle. The back streets of Kabul, with you know, Taliban back in 2001, now again functioning streets. Um, the right across the city you're seeing you know, a very different uh, kind of landscape, physical landscape, and you're seeing, as well as the physical landscape, um, very different people. So, and, and there's even shopping malls in Kabul. And that's all, again, that's, uh, you know, that's the, so what has happened? Um, over the last uh, 20 years. It's the, the Jama Masjid, the big mosque on the other side of the river, um, teeming now with, uh, with, you know, with coaches and uh, much better built than it was. And it's also, of course, in terms of the people of the country. This girl wasn't born on 9-11. Um, and there she is, you know, proudly voting in the 2019 election, showing the ink on her finger that she's voting. Um, you know, the Afghan cricket team, the Blue Tigers, highly regarded. Um, uh, worldwide, you know, playing now at World Cup level, uh, women climbing mountains in Afghanistan, the restoration of the Dar al Aman Mosque. I mean, it, it goes on. There's a sort of there's a completely different sort of society, and I think the Taliban are going to find it much more difficult this time to uh, to govern um, in the uh, new Afghanistan. So I'll stop there, and um, very happily engage in in many questions.